maneira. Bem, olá, boa tarde, bem-vindos a, a Working Remotely or Remotely Working. Um, I, so, when I initially uh, submitted the talk, I said I was going to do the talk in English. I don't know if everyone uh, talks English. Anyone has a problem with that? No? Okay. So, uh, I'll talk about the challenges I faced when I switched from uh, normal office environments, like working from 9 to 5, to a 100% remote company. Um, if uh, some of you are already uh, working on a remote company, some of these challenges might already be familiar to you. Maybe you have different challenges depending on your setup, or maybe, I don't know, you're not liking it. So here's a little bit of my experience. So to tell you uh, about the way I switched, um, I, I've been doing this for a couple of years now. And um, before that, I was working at Sapo. Actually, when I worked there, I think the logo was different, but anyway. Um, I was working there, and Sapo is a very friendly company to uh, flexible work hours, so I didn't have a problem with that. If you were sick, you could work from home. That wasn't the problem. I was taking school at time, and I could also, um, well, skip a day, work from home. That wasn't a problem, but you, you weren't supposed to work like a week from home. That, that wasn't the, the way things worked. And one of the things that I found great at Sapo was uh, I could just reach out to the person I needed. So if I was working with a designer, for example, I worked, I worked on the iOS team. If I needed to talk to the designer about a certain screen, it was super easy to just reach out to him and we would spend an afternoon playing around or improving the app. That was great, by the way. Not for project times, but for me as a developer and for him. Um, so that was one of the great things there. And I, I thought at the time that that was what kept quality high. When I switched, I, I now realized that the problem was at Sapo, everything was so synchronous. That was the thing. So if you were doing something, you could just interrupt someone. So SAPs were something not that rare. When you go to remote, you switch from sync to asynchronous. You can't think like that. ACPs are like currency. You don't spend them all in the same place. If you keep interrupting people, they won't get any work done. That and, of course, your colleagues are probably a tab. If your colleagues are a tab, you don't know if they are there or not. So you kind of have a filter. That was one of the first shocks I had. Because I joined, I needed something, and I was like, well, why isn't this person online? So that switch took some time, and I believe it's mainly the switch you see when you go from normal office to remote. So I would like to um, now try to sell remote to you. So just a little bit, I would like to um, expose some of the advantages I find in remote working. First one is the commute. Not having to commute, of course, not having to commute. Uh, I, I hated my commute, and I, I lived close by, actually. People <laughs> lived way um, far away than me, um, and I hated it. Uh, so you get up early, I'm not an early person. Um, you, you have to travel at high traffic hours to go to work, just like everyone else. And I know everyone puts up with it, but it, it's not great. At, at a certain point in my career, I was spending around three hours commuting per day. That's like eight work days a month. That's time. So always hated the commute. With remote, I don't have to do that. That's eight hours I save. That's time I save every morning. I work from home. Some of my colleagues don't, but I do. And usually I start working like in the kitchen counter. I'm, doing, I'm making coffee, and I already, I'm already reading Slack or I even bring the laptop and start working there. So no commutes. Cool. Uh, by the way, I've researched this a little bit, and I found that some studies point that commutes uh, lead to stress, insomnia, and uh, obesity. Of course, these are US studies, so. Uh, but commutes, bad thing. Um, second thing is, best people aren't always close by. So if you think about the best programmer, right, the best person for the job, what do you think is like the well, the probability that that person is sitting next to you. Given that we are a pixel scam, maybe there's some probability, but apart from that, usually they are not. So you can hire, you have a much more broader reach when hiring. And that was something we'll talk about later when I talk about hiring. 
But for example, at Macria, we have, I don't know, we, have a, we are around 20, 30 uh, just developers, so no designers, no management. And we are from all over the place. In the US, in India, in Europe, I think we have someone in Northern Europe. I don't think we have someone in Africa, actually, but we have people all around the place. Um, so, oh, the previous point, sorry. Uh, one thing is, people think that remote means you can hire cheap, and about that topic. So good people will always be expensive. You're not the only one hiring remote. So if in a global marketplace, a good person in India will charge you probably the same as a good person in Portugal. You won't hire cheap because he knows he can get more. It's not rocket science. A lot of people are doing remote now. So not a way for getting developers cheaper. Unless you are from the valley. In that case, I believe you can get them cheaper because, well, everything's cheaper than that. Um, next is keep them. People move like a lot along, along uh, their lives. Their spouses or their husbands, they need to move, they get a better job. So if you have a person that's key to your company, that's key to your project, is a key developer, if that person says, I need to move, I need to move closer to my family, I want to travel, whatever, why lose them? So with remote, you don't get that. If everyone is working from remote, it doesn't matter. I, I have no idea where most of my colleagues are, and I don't care. So. Next, this is a, a big point for me, personally. Some peop this is not specific to remote, of course. You can have a great work-life balance outside of remote or not. But with remote, with that async thing, you don't have the same pressure. You don't have that thing where you, I don't know, you're at the office and it's 5 o'clock, you finish something, and then you, you, kinda, you spend one more hour browsing or something. You're not doing anything, just waiting to finish the day and not leave early. You don't get that with remote. So I work at home. Right, five o'clock, I don't have anything else to do. Well, I go play a game or I get out or something like that. So this helped a lot with me. Uh, I scratched the when. I, I was going to go with when, but that's simply not true. There's no company where you can work when you want. It's, it's just not true. If you have clients, if you have coworkers, you cannot work like, in the middle of the night and just forget about your coworkers. So, with remote, what you can do is you can work where you want, and that's the key. So if you're productive in one place, you can work on that place. If you want to switch places every week, that's okay. If you want to pick up your kids at school later, that's also okay. If you want to work from a train, okay. So the where is the important part. So not the when. Don't think of remote as uh, that. Uh, also, by the way, remote doesn't mean you can work from home. Uh, um, working from home, first of all, this seems like one of those spammy ads, work from home, make money. So remote doesn't exactly mean you, you work from home. Some people are not productive at home. I'm, I am lucky enough that I am, and I adjusted most of my schedule to, because I live with a person that has a normal schedule, normal people, uh, or some schedule. Um, but, um, but most people are not. So you can find a co-working space, there's plenty of them, people are, I met a guy that worked on an IKEA, so free coffee during the week, uh, great tables, Wi-Fi. Um, you can work whatever you want, basically. Uh, Co-working spaces are also a great choice. Um, diversity. So this is a popular team. I, I won't talk. I, I don't want to turn the talk into this, but so there's basically this is very discussed in our area. There's two opinions. Some people think, of course, it's great for you to have diversity in your team. Diversity of um, cultures, language, races, sex, whatever. Um, and that makes your team or your product better. And some other people are concerned that you aren't hiring people based on merit anymore. You are choosing them because of any particular culture or something. Not wanting to side with one side or another, I'll just say that remote, well, you get multicultural for free. So our team is multicultural. That's the kind of the definition when you start hiring from all around the world. And you get pretty diversity, and you also hire them uh, based on their merits. So you're hiring based on the merits, and because you're remote, that leads to uh, diversity. So those are kind of the points I, I wanted to try to sell you remote. Uh, for the next slides, I'll, I'll talk about some of the questions people have asked me, and I asked in the beginning some of the misconceptions. So right now you're thinking, yeah, that's all great, but there are problems, true. 
there's problems with every work method. And I'll try to talk about some of this. I call them misconceptions. So number one is time zones. Time zones are a problem. That's true. Um, but that's something you can't avoid. Nothing to do with remote. Again, if you have clients in different time zones, you're going to have that problem. People ask me, you're working remote. There's some guys in San Francisco. There's some guys in India. Do you have late meetings, like 1 AM with clients? Yes, I've had those, but I can count them by one hand in a couple of years. So that doesn't happen that often. People understand boundaries. They understand people are in different time zones. And usually what we end up doing is not everyone is at that meeting that happens once a week. Maybe someone skips, then you update them. That's fine. So time zones. That's one thing. Another, of course, is Slack. Everyone knows Slack is great. So Slack helps a lot. Um, and uh, of course, managing your notifications. That's, that's, kind of, that's key. In the beginning, I would use Slack. I have 10 channels right now in Slack. Uh, not counting pixels, camp, actually. Um, and I, I didn't manage the sleep thing. So yeah, that was like all day crazy, being in on my phone and watch. So manage your <laughs> notifications. It's another thing. Uh, occasionally, you're going to have some uh, late meetings. That's, that's normal. That's part of life. Second one, clients don't like remote. Clients like good work. It doesn't matter to them if you do remote or not. There are some clients worried with security. That's true. There are ways around that. Lots of Cisco VPNs and going to get laptops or send them to us or something like that. There's weird stuff, but clients like good work. So this is not at all a problem, but was one of the things that I heard. Uh, one th two pieces of advice for perfect harmony with clients. First, be straightforward with them. You don't want to let them, I don't know, you don't want to let them know one week after the project starts that the developer is in India or in Ireland. You want to be straightforward from the beginning, come out, tell them that you are remote, tell them that works great for other clients, and they will accept it. Second thing is, um, get them in the loop. So get them into Slack, talk to them, let them participate. They will see work getting done. They will see you do the work, you're remote. They will understand the boundaries. Usually clients don't like to work weekends either, so set the boundaries and tell them that. Um, okay. um, the office is more productive. This is true for uh, s some people, but if you, if you ask yourselves, last time, let's say you need to get a project done and you really need to focus. Um, last time you were really productive for five hours, was that at the office? And if yes, was that during peak hour? So after lunch, three o'clock, are you productive at the office? Most people will probably say no. Most people will say yes, I'm very productive at the office uh, in the morning before everyone comes in or late at night when everyone lifts, lives. So the office is not necessarily more productive. It can be. Again, with remote you can choose to go to an office. I don't find it like that. Too much noise, too much interruptions. And I, I bet that if you ask yourselves, you won't find it more productive either. Um, this is a question I asked my I asked Mokri when I joined. So one of the first questions I asked them was, yeah, this, this remote thing is all great, but I mean, do people show up for, for working? <laughs> what if someone is not working? Do you know they are not working? Uh, how do you check up on them? Do they disappear? Um, so second one never happened. People don't disappear. Just like normal people, you know where they live, not necessarily an address, but you, you know where they live online, and people do care about that these days. And uh, the first one, if you know people are working, as good managers discovered over time, you don't need, if you are good people, you don't need to know if they're working or not. That's not the case. You just need to talk to them from time to time and figure out if they need anything. That's key. So remote workers are just like any others. Now, those are the misconceptions. Um, and after that, I have a few slides about the problems, uh, the challenges, let's say. So next slide is culture. Uh, so culture is another term used in our area. And culture, culture isn't exactly that Christmas dinner party or a ping pong table. 
culture is basically the way, as a company, you approach problems and the way you inspire people to also do that. So usually if you're a company and you have a problem and you solve that problem by working late hours into the weekend, you'll probably set that into your culture. Every time a big problem comes again, people will do the same. It worked before. So that's culture. Culture in a remote environment is even more crucial. You really need to let people know what are the expectations from them in terms of time because you don't know if people are overworking or burning. You really have to watch that. And second thing, a strong culture reduces communication. So if it's very clear what are the values, what are the ways to approach a problem in a company, you don't to need to communicate as much. So culture, big challenge. People usually don't care that much about this. They just put it into slides, just like I did. Um, but it's, it's important in the day-to-day -day basis. Hiring is another thing. So hiring is very important in any company, of course. Um, a, a great hire, losing a great hire isn't as bad as hiring someone that's bad. Usually you prefer to lose someone great than to hire someone bad. The impact is usually bigger. So hiring in remote, what I found out during these years is juniors don't quite work. Um, it's not that they don't work, but it's, you need people that you can give them work, they go and they do asynchronously on their own. They don't keep asking you questions. And juniors are tough for that. You can, of course, hire someone and train them and there's pair programming and all that, but then you're just back again at the same problem where you need to have everyone online, same time zone and all that and the process is way slower. If you need to hire a junior and you need to train them very well, remote might fail a little bit for you there. Next there's onboarding. So if you hire someone to do remote, remote company, they, they are in Slack, they joined. They, perhaps they don't have a client the first few days because they are unreliable. Um, so you hire them, what now? you really need to have the onboarding. Because when you're in a company, uh, you can just ask around. If you need someone, you need some information, you can just ask around, someone will tell you. In a remote setting, well, you don't know who to ask. So you just start asking questions, and that doesn't work well um, sometimes. So you really need a good onboarding process. Let them know um, who's handling what. Uh, second thing is, if you're, if you're already a normal office and you intend to move a team remote or you, you want to convince your boss or something like that, the best person is probably someone that already knows the company, your best worker, because he knows who are the key players, who handles what. That's the best person to go remote. He can do most of his job without being next to that person. Ego handling. So, writing on a chat you sometimes you don't pass the right emotions let's say so as a programmer I had this problem small problem um, so we write something and sometimes that comes out too strong so you're just I don't know you're being a jerk or someone's being a jerk to you and sometimes you don't even understand that you're just saying things like you usually say but the person isn't seeing your face so ego handling is something you, you learn, but if you have someone from the company that's already used to um, this setting, the person can look into the chat and say, talk to both persons and say, hey look, this might be misunderstood. For me, that, that I'm not a, a native uh, English speaker, that was even worse, because I, I used to say a lot of things that now I don't. <laughs> you understand the, well, the power of uh, some words. Uh, so this is something that you have to watch for if you work mainly on Slack. Um, isolation. So this is a, a big team, believe, a big um, problem, believe it or not. Some companies even uh, give perks to employees that work remote. For example, there's companies that um, give them uh, like a gym subscription or, I don't know, uh, free vegetables, stuff like that. Um, that forces them to not always be at home. Because for me, for example, I work at home. If I spend three days without going out to lunch with someone, I start to go crazy. So you want to watch that. Always check up with someone. When you hire them, 
explain that if you're coming from a normal office where you see people every day, people you work with, your friends, you'll stop seeing people every day at work. You can't depend on work to make new friends. And, well, work is not, are not your friends anymore. So now you must go out and find another hobby or another activity where you can meet new people or hang out with the people you already know. So this is, a, this is something I, I didn't know when I joined. It's something I, you really have to watch for. Um, transparency. So at a company, you usually have something like a water cooler or someone that talks a lot. So usually you know everything, even things that aren't about your project. You know someone's getting married, you know something's getting, I don't know, some project is getting cut or some project is starting. You know these things. People talk. At a remote setup, you don't. So you don't have the, the water cooler where people talk. So you really must do the transparency thing where you have like monthly meetings or I don't know weekly meetings or whatever uh, some people get together uh, for example there's companies that uh, do a get together uh, annually with everyone in the company and they fly everyone in for example the guys that do um, WordPress do that so they fly everyone in uh, into a place and they meet once yearly there's more companies doing that we aren't by the way um, yet but uh, you really need to tell people what's going on on every project. And also, if you have a boss or a manager or whatever, one-to-one -one meetings are very important. Meetings where you can ask, because in a, in a global meeting in a company, you have like 40 people, you won't ask, hey, look, what's going on with that project that I have no business knowing. But if you're talking to just one person, if that person leaves you, well, at, at ease, you can just ask him, hey, what about that project? And I know, people are curious, at least I am. And you like to know the company is doing well. You don't see these guys. So they might go out of business tomorrow, you don't know. So <laughs> transparency, it's important for that. Oops, okay. So that's, uh, that's all. Uh, to recap, remote isn't exactly a solution to all your problems. It's just another work method. There are problems with it, just like with anything else. Um, I find it very useful and a great way of working. If I were to start a company right now, I would probably uh, start with Remote. And um, well, thank you for coming. Um, I would like to get any questions, if some of you have, and any criticism. If you find Remote doesn't work, I love to hear that. Thank you. There's a microphone. From the beginning, you talk about this, but I'd like to know about management. On remote, and go ahead. I'll repeat the question. Okay. So on remote, you think that management can be more flat, or So if at remote management can be more flat or more. Uh, vertical, let's say. Um, okay, so I, I don't believe that's a specific uh, remote question because you can have differences in non-remote setups, of course. But in remote, if you have a very hierarchical thing, you tend to have like, um, I don't know, a lot of passing the message. At remote, because we, we tend to hire only pros, okay? You only hire the A players. You need them to work alone, right? If you only do that, everyone is an expert in their field. So, if you have, a, let's say you have a, a conversation with a client, you're working on a project with a client, and the client asks you if you can add a certain feature, or I can add a certain feature. I don't go running to the manager and asking that. I don't do that. I tell him yes or no. So at a setup like this, if you have that, uh, you always go to the manager, and the manager go to his boss and all that, you lose a lot of time. You start, you start having like paperwork and emails and all that. We don't do that. And I, I wouldn't advise you to have that because time zones, you would just spend like two days until you can answer the client. It's way faster if you hire someone and trust them to do their work. That's what you're paying for, actually. Any more questions? Yeah. How long have you been working remote? So I believe it's two years and something now. So, so yeah. And I, I worked before a couple of jobs as a freelancer, but 
how many time zones we have. Okay, uh, so we have basically from San Francisco, I believe there was someone in Japan some time ago, but I, I think he left. He was in Japan, then he left. Uh, so basically that's uh, minus eight for San Francisco and uh, India, for example, which is the common, um, another common place is uh, five and a half. So I've been in talks with, uh, in conversations with people from San Francisco, India, Lisbon, London, all in the same call. So usually 6 p.m. is the best time for the San Francisco folks. What was the biggest drawback I had when working remote? So that isolation thing, that, that's real. Um, I, I felt that a lot. I, I insisted I would work from home. First of all, that took me some time to adapt because, so I leave my room, right? I go to the kitchen, make some coffee, then I go to the office. You're always at work. You can say you're always at home, that's true, but you can also say you're always at work. So I would leave work, just moving from the office to the living room. I had to learn to separate that, to set expectations with everyone in the company and with clients that from a certain time, doesn't matter if I'm five feet away from the computer, I'm still not working. So that was challenging. Isolation, very challenging. I, I set up, so folks at SAPU, I, I usually go there to lunch. Everyone, sometimes I see me there because I just keep going to my last company to have lunch with my last, well, colleagues. Uh, because I, I don't see the, the Mokria people. So that, that was key for me. And sometimes it takes some effort to you contact old friends, you set up coffees. That was something. Um, okay, so. Um, okay, if we have communication barriers with clients, colleagues, and how we overcome them. Uh, yes, I've had communication barriers. I'm much better now at talking. Uh, believe it or not, I'm much better at English than I was when I started. Um, so you get better at that for your colleagues. Um, it's difficult sometimes. Your colleagues aren't the problem because if your colleague he says something you don't understand, you can always ask him to explain, to repeat. It gets kind of problematic if he has to repeat like twice or three times. But with a client, that's really serious. If you don't understand a client you're in a call, well, you ask him once. If you start asking more than once, that gets bad. So how we overcome them? Usually I'm not alone in a call. So a lot of times I've had to ask someone to, because I, I miss like one word or something, so I ask one of my colleagues. Another way of overcoming that is, well, you just train. You talk a lot every day. So that was, oh, and you hire people with good communication skills. If you hire someone that can't speak English, well, that, that's a major problem. You get the e ego handling thing, the person will say things, does that make sense? And you also get someone that can communicate. That can be a very, very serious. We've had good applicants, very good applicants, technically. Great guys, great programmers, and we can't hire them because they can't speak, uh, well, good enough English. That, that's a problem. So if you're coding, don't, don't skip English classes or something like that. Okay, so uh, what tools do we use and for what, basically? Okay, in terms of communication. We use Slack a lot, everyone does, no big deal. We were using it before it was cool. So, um, apart from Slack, we invite clients to Slack, that's another key thing. I know a lot of companies do, but we stress that. So we have, we have usually we have like one Slack channel for clients where we talk with them, developers, then we have another private channel, uh, channel for the developers where we put up the GitHub notifications start having a lot of them that gets more into the clients and we have another one which is kind of a, an internal uh, channel to that project where we have the manager and the programmers the designers everyone together except the client okay so in terms of other tools we use zoom a lot Skype sucks uh, sorry um, uh, but Skype does suck uh, for for like 40 people Skype starts to go down so we use zoom zoom works well for us at least for now they have an app for everything um, we, use, we don't use that much video, actually. Uh, I think we tend to use video when we are on uh, initial conversations with clients, you know, to establish that trust and all that. But then we start cutting on that. Day-to-day -day basis, daily meetings, something like that, we don't use the video, we just use the voice. But voice is way faster than typing on Slack. 
So typing on Slack is usually something, again, very async. It's not quite email, but it's like, when you have the time, look at this. And Zoom is like, I need help. Can we talk five minutes? And then we just paste the Zoom link. Someone taps, and there it goes. Now you have uh, Slack calls. They also work some. Yeah, for two person, three, they, they work. Okay, that's the, the tools. Any other questions? What were my strategies to deal with isolation? So, well, first, it helps if you have friends outside of work. So that's, that's the first part. So I just try to reconnect with some friends. Um, there's also hobbies. I mean, sign yourself for a photography class or a yoga class or something like that. So find an hobby if you want to meet new people, all that. I, with the remote, most companies will be very yeah, I have my yoga class. Most companies are like, yeah, cool, that's, that's okay. Skip the meeting, go to the yoga class. So um, that's, that's cool with most companies. And um, try to, to have a meal every time. I, I was talking with someone outside just 10 minutes before the talk started, and he was telling me um, that he, he tries to have a breakfast. Every day, someone goes out of the house, and then he comes back again, and he works. So that's, the, that's his thing. For me, it's the lunches. And also, I live with someone, which is easier to, to deal, and we invite people for, for dinner. So yeah, that's, uh, that's the way I deal. Uh, meals. OK, so how did I got started into remote, and what are the requirements that I think are needed for a person? So I got started just like everyone gets started a new job. So I, I was not very comfortable at the place I was. Not that it was a problem at SAPO. SAPO is great. Um, the thing is, I wanted something new. So I searched on We Work Remotely. If you're working for a remote job, by the way, that site is great. Um, there, there's a couple out there, Working Nomads also. They send you a newsletter. But working remotely, I have. Um, so we have posted jobs there. We, I have looked at jobs there. I've sent people there that found jobs. So great website, great resource. It's from the guys that do the remote book, by the way. Highly recommend you read it. Uh, a lot of um, the information I have here, it's replicated in the book, and they have way more. Uh, so those guys have been doing it for like 15 years or something with 37 signals. Um, so the requirements I, I find. Um, so good communication skill is key, really, really key. Uh, when you interview a person, we usually we do more than one interview. We do two technicals and one kind of talky half an hour to find out what kind of person it is. That happens first. So good communication skills, key. You don't get to the second one. Second is if you can work, if you're, if you're expert enough to work alone, basically. And that, that, requires, that basically requires seniors. If you don't have a senior, it's hard, because the person needs help, uh, which is perfectly normal. And in a remote setup, that can be a problem. So hire seniors and good communication skills. And um, also, you kind of get a feel from the person. If the person is, if you ask them, for example, let's say you have a problem uh, with a client. What do you do? You, you send an email? You, you ask that, that type of question. If the, per if the person is someone that is always running to their manager or always running to their boss and they can take a step without, that might be a problem for you. You'll have to adjust them to this uh, way of working. You can do it, but you'll have that trouble. So if you can hire someone that's very independent, probably a freelancer, someone that all worked remote before, that will be easier for you. Okay, so that, okay, uh, accounting issues and um, legal and all that. So that, that's something I didn't touch because at Mokri I'm not in contact with that topic, but I, I know a little bit. So basically, uh, every country uh, has some way of you as an individual uh, establishing yourself as a company. So in Portugal is the Cibivirt, and you have a lot of stuff like that in every country. There's easier countries and other countries. Um, but usually they do have. So do that, find a way of uh, giving invoices to someone, and 
most companies in the US accept that. Um, and that's, that's okay for most accountants, both in Portugal and other places. Um, what else? Well, I think that's it. Uh, legal and um, accounting, it's that. Do I ever see my team? In Zoom? Does Zoom count? No. Oh. Okay, so I, I'm seeing most, I'm seeing some of my team right now. There's one here, there's another there. Um, sorry for pointing you out, guys. Um, so I see the Portuguese part of my team, and we are more than one, which is great. Um, we now have um, some uh, Brazilian folks, which is great, by the way, because uh, they, they have, very, they have um, a very technical education there in Brazil. They have good schools. Uh, they, they have a um, big internet thing going there and they are having more and more startups just like us. And they are in the same time zone in some cities as New York, for example, or the middle of the US. So they, they, are, they make great remote workers. Uh, and they are slightly cheaper than Silicon Valley if you're there, of course. So, um, you know, I see my team. I see the Portuguese folks. The American folks, no. We are planning a big get-together annually, like everyone would come to Lisbon or Israel, we have a guy there, uh, or some place like that. Um, I'm hoping it's Lisbon because I don't like, I don't like to travel that much. Uh, but some people are like, yeah, Israel. Uh, so, I don't know. I talked about that. Are remote workers cheaper? No, they, are, they aren't necessarily. Again, they are cheaper than the Valley because there's nothing more expensive than there for hiring uh, talent. But they are not, they are not cheap work. That's, that's not remote. That's uh, freelance.com, elance.com, something like that. that that's, that's that. Remote is not that. Someone that works remote can go to another company. There's more doing this. So you can, <laughs> you can get the prices up if you're good. So why would you charge less? Uh, usually, what you have is you have an above ma average salary. I, I won't go into details, of course, but you you can get usually you can get, of course, more money than you would work for a local company or one of the higher salaries. And you do remote. You kind of doing remote, you can get more money, but it's still cheaper than whoever's uh, hiring you where they are from. You said that a moment ago. Also, remote worker. He knows. He knows what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, what is my normal day work? That's kind of shameful. So I, I get up. I go to the kitchen. I make coffee. I have a, one of those Aeropress hipster things. It's cool. Easy to clean. Um, so I make coffee. I start off with Slack. Sometimes I do a Zoom. I ask uh, what's going on since the the night before or the afternoon before. Um, then I go to the office, I start working. So, by the way, I wake up like 10 a.m., so this isn't like early rising. Uh, then around one, I go to lunch, I go out, I come back like two, two and a half. Uh, I work some more, and usually I make uh, like some pauses. I, I take some breaks. I go to the kitchen and eat something, I play with the cat. Uh, some time ago, when Dark Souls came out, I would take more breaks. Now I'm more controlled, so not playing that anymore. Uh, and then I would compensate during the night. Sometimes I, I go back to the computer like midnight and I work for like one hour. I, I still like working at home. But usually I end my day at around 7 and um, my wife comes home around 6, so she has like one hour to play Overwatch without me bugging her. So um, yeah, it's kind of my it's work. Sorry? Do I have work meetings? Um, meetings. I do have work meetings. Um, sometimes I, there has been like twice or three times that I had them like late at night, like 1 a.m. because the client was not an early riser just like me and the, the, I don't know, the business guy or something wanted to meet at is 3 p.m. in San Francisco and I was like, okay, I'll do the effort. So, but usually I do that like in the honeymoon phase if a client starts doing that when you're already doing the project, I say, no, no. I, I don't do meetings at 1 a.m. Uh, again, setting the expectations. Uh, some people like it. Some people love working at 1 a.m. I'm just one of, one of those people. Because again, I live with someone that has a normal work. If I didn't, I would probably <laughs> leave during the night, but uh, I can't. Go ahead. Sorry?
biggest project we have. We have very long projects. So right now, um, so I'll go to you after. Uh, right now, I am. So at Mokria, right now, we are working for some pretty big clients. We work with Intel, Twitter, uh, those folks. Uh, I believe we had some deals with Google also. No Apple, unfortunately for me, um, so far, by the way. Um, the size of the projects. Those are very big. We have teams of more than 10 people working remote uh, for one of these big clients. And uh, we also have uh, projects that more than six months. For example, for SanDisk, we did projects for like six months to a year. Uh, TrueCar also, we did a very big project with them. I participated in that one. Um, and we also have smaller projects. So sometimes a startup or something comes to talk to us and they want like one month or two month thing just helping update or something. So we also do that. that that's, that gentleman over there. Lots of times. I think I, I get the question. So how do we deal with prioritization if we have our programmers saying to the client yes or no to things? How do they check up, especially with big projects? I mean, if you say yes to everything, you might end up in a tricky situation, right? OK, so that's a on-the-spot question. Um, so I don't have that problem because I'm, I, I don't think, I don't have that approach where a programmer is not the right person to talk to a client. I, I, I don't care what your job are. You might be good talking to clients or not. Doesn't matter if you're a programmer or a manager. I've seen managers that are terrible. Um, by the way, putting a manager on a technical conversation with a client, when the client is asking if something is possible, that doesn't always go right either. So I've had managers saying yes to everything, and there you go, you have the same problem. So it's not a matter of having the programmers or not. It's a matter of having someone that has the scope. And if you have a very transparent project, you know, you know as a programmer. Being a programmer is no excuse for you to say yes to everything and extend the, the, the deadline. You know the deadline, you know the project. You probably know it b better than the manager itself. So that's not exactly an excuse. And again, if you hire certain type of people, you don't get that problem. If you do, it's always normal. You tell the client, hey look, we estimated for this. In the meantime, you asked us this, this, and of course there's a contract and all that. And you said, you ask us for this, this, and this. We won't be able to do that. Clients understand. If they are having monthly, um, weekly meetings, sorry, not monthly. If they are having weekly meetings with you or daily, they already know. When you're going to tell them, hey, look, I, I can't do that feature, they say, yeah, we know. We have been watching your speed and seeing what you're doing. They're, they're not stupid either. So or not paying attention to the project. Probably they're the guys paying the most attention, right? They are paying for the project. So they, they know that. No, we don't have that problem. <laughs> Uh, that depends. Uh, oh, so the, the question was, uh, what's our deal with clients if we do like time-based or closed project and something like that? That depends. Um, actually, I, I'm not the qualified person to <laughs> answer you that, but I, I bet that depends Yeah, uh, on the client and on the project. Anyone else? Lady over there. Do I have any other tools? So I've been using Rescue Time lately. I don't know if you guys know of it. It's basically a Trojan. You install it, and it sends everything you do to a uh, server. I'm not super comfortable with it, as you can get by my uh, tone. Uh, but it does uh, tell you um, your productivity score, because you define what applications are productive for you or not. Some people define Slack as productive. Uh, some people don't. I don't. So every time I spend on Slack counts as the 13 hours non-productive time. So I, I use that to kind of measure 
uh, weekly. And so that's one thing. I use Zoom a lot. We use GitHub a lot, but that's a developer thing. So we use GitHub, we use pull requests a lot, and uh, we do code review for everything. That's how we keep uh, quality high. Uh, since you don't have a, a, a team close to you, and when you hire them, the tendency is for everyone does their style of code. And that ends up being a big blob. So we do code review for every single line. Sometimes clients like to do it when they have a technical team. So we use GitHub a lot. For scheduling, we use just Calendar. We, I use Calendly for choosing time zones and allowing people to uh, choose that. For interviews, it's very useful. Um, I guess that's it. Uh, if I remember anything, you can come and ask me. Yeah. Um, anything else? Clapping? No? So um, from my work at SAPO, so in comparison, I, I've worked in other places, you know, but OK. From my work at SAPO, uh, if I think the remote uh, projects are more challenging, nothing to do with remote, uh, just being in a different company. Um, it's, I like the agency model. I, I really like, because I, I don't like spending like two years working on a project. I, I realize that. Um, so in that sense, it's more challenging. The projects at Mukri are great, by the way. My, my boss will probably be seeing this. So projects at Mukri are great. Mukri is great. Um, I really enjoy it. Um, no, but seriously, working for these big companies and being part of uh, something that touches millions of users, it's, of course, something that millions and billions and all that, something that appeals uh, very much to me. But also, you have the real possibility of screwing up, which is also another bad thing. Um, yeah, I would say I'm better now. That's why I did the change. Um, but you know, people get tired of stuff. I don't know how to answer that. SAP was great also, by the way. <laughs> People know. People know. Sorry? Coding tests. Oh, coding. My view on coding tests. Um, so my view on coding tests is very by the book. So I believe tests are great. You should always do tests especially before you start coding, do test kits. But we, in the day-to-day -day basis, we end up not doing that much, just like everyone else. Oh, you, oh, you mean like uh, testing from the higher? OK, I'll rephrase the question. Sorry, sorry. So the, the question is, on our hiring process, how do we test candidates for their knowing how to code since we don't see them face to face and we don't have that uh, closed uh, room thing? Another thing, another great thing I took from SAPO, by the way, SAPO has a great interview process. I, I loved it. I, I left the process thinking I was the stupidest person on, her, on the earth, and then someone hired me. It was super weird. Um, so I spent like three hours then, and I, I heard from some friends that if you spend half an hour, you're out. So you have to spend two hours or more, because, well, you have to make up time. So talk slowly or something. Um, at Mukria, I try to replicate that. So in particular, in my case, when I'm interviewing someone for iOS, I tend to ask them a lot of questions. And the questions I ask them, they are not coding questions. Usually, they are more like explain the API to me questions. Not how you use it, how it works. That's what I want. Because a junior or a mid developer, they know how to use the API. They can make apps just like everyone else. Anyone, a junior can, make my, can probably do my job slowly, but can do it. Uh, the thing is, they have to know how it works, because when they have a problem, that's what I want. I don't want a person that goes to Google seeing how to fix a problem. I, I want a person that when they, sees a, they see a problem, they debug and they try to understand it before fixing it. If they fix it and don't understand the problem, that's the wrong approach. That's, you're not fixing the problem. You are finding a way of it to work. You don't know if it's fixed. So I try to look for that. Um, the other thing I, I look for, it's kinda, I, I ask them a small exercise, very, very small. So no APIs first. No third-party APIs. That's, that's my thing. But I asked them an exercise with no third-party APIs where they have to do a connection to the web, very typical stuff, parse some JSON. I just want to see how they code. I just want to see the, the comments. And if they go with a simple approach, I've seen crazy things for parsing JSON on samples from interviews. Like, that. I, I could do that. The exercise I give to, to people, I could do that on a line. And it's not a, it's a terrible line. You wouldn't write that. But I can do it simple way. And I've seen people do, like, multiple classes and parsers and objects and weird stuff. I, 
I always like to see how simple they go. That's why I ask them for something simple. But at the end of the day, I'm not the only one doing the RD process. So after me, there's someone that usually do, does that algorithms question, where they ask, uh, how do you order a weird list, uh, blah, blah, blah. I, I don't do that. I don't believe in that. But we do that, and uh, that person believes. And you have to kind of go through all the process, because y you might end up working with me or with that person. That person knows what he's looking for. So we do two in interviews because of that, and sometimes even more, if you need. So that's how, we, that's how I go about it. Not speaking for Mukriya here. Um, anything else? I need some water. No? OK. So uh, in that case, thank you for coming. And hope I, I inspired some of you. Thank you. Thank you very much.